episode 86 of the Cricket Her Weekly. And I sound quite croaky again um, because it turned out that last weekend wasn't just a hangover from the Cricket Society lunch, I was getting a really bad cold. So apologies for the croakiness of my voice. Um, first up, we're going to review latest happenings in WBBL. Um, and there's been quite a bit of action over the last few days. So Sid, where are we at at the moment? What, what does the table look like? The table looks like uh, a very good thing for the Renegades. So the Renegades um, in their red shirts are sitting pretty on top. Um, they're well clear of the heat in second place. And in fact, they had a sort of classic four-pointer uh, this weekend. And the Renegades hit 200 and was it 207 runs, I think, um, to beat the heat. Um, the Heat almost got there as well. It was that was quite a match. I believe yeah. that's the highest aggregate score there's been in a WBBL match. Um, and uh, then the Renegades also managed to restrict the Stars to just 103, and they chased those quite easily wow. as well. So two more wins for the Renegades puts them clear on 15 points. Now it has to be said there's still quite a way to go. Um, I did have a look at running my table analysis software this morning and there were uh, I think over 3 billion permutations <laughs> remaining. Um, and my table not analysis many. software was like, I can get this done for you, but it's not gonna be quick. Um, so I said, no, it's okay. We can we can wait another couple of days. Um, so it's, I mean, it's definitely still possible for the, even the Sydney Thunder that are currently bottom to, to still qualify. They've got five points. Um, so there's still everything to play for and every team could still win it of course you finish fourth battle your way through those two semi-finals get to the final you can still end up being the team that lifts the trophy okay. so you know money could still be reasonably placed on sydney thunder as well as anyone but at the moment renegades looking good in first place um so the the, the big story from an english point of view was the renegades eve jones yeah. um who had one of the kind of innings of her career um against the, the heat in their, in their huge score um it's just 60 something or 40 something balls um and it was sort of classic eve jones innings in some way i posted a graph of this on twitter which you might want to go and check out um eve jones never starts off quickly um so a typical eve jones innings she'll you know the first sort of 10 15 balls she'll be going at about you know sort of 65 um you know, in terms of like a strike rate and then she'll kind of climb up and she'll eventually finish you know as, as long as she's still there she'll typically get to about a strike rate of about 100 after sort of 25 Five balls. If she goes on past that, she'll continue to go at a strike rate of um, just over 100. Um, what she did differently this time, she still, still started actually quite slowly. She started off at a strike rate just about 80 for the first 10 balls, but then she really lifted it up and really took it to another level. Um, and she ended up, she kind of touched 150 at one point, finished on a strike rate of 140. Um, so, you know, fantastic performances from her out in Australia. Um, now, of course, England are going to be going to Australia, um, Raf. Uh, in January, yeah, we hope. Eve Jones, England, you know, would we want to say those words in the same sentence? <laughs> I think you just did. Um, well, I mean, you know, I think that um, if I was Heather Knight or Lisa Kitely, then I'd certainly be paying very close attention to her performances in WBBL. Um, I mean, you know, that was that was a really... Um, a really excellent innings from her the other day, as you point out. I think in the in the next inning she went on and made a, a five ball duck. Um, so that's cricket, isn't it? Um, it's highs and lows. Um, but if she can hit a couple more scores like that, um, that sixty odd, um, then why would you not be picking her for the Ashes? I I, I just, you know, um, England don't always make rational selection decisions. Uh, as well, rational. The, the as in by that I mean the decisions that I would make. Um, but she's out in Australia. She's she's in form. Um, she is getting accustomed to Australian conditions. She's hitting runs against Australian bowlers. Um, and on you know on all of those fronts, she has surely has a massive advantage against all of the other England players, um, or almost all of the other England players um, who are currently at home um, training in a very miserable, very cold Loughborough. Um, you know, I, it's just, it would seem odd to therefore ignore somebody who's out in Australia actually making runs against the bowlers that they're going to be facing in the Ashes. So so why wouldn't she be in contention? And if she isn't, then there's something wrong. Yeah, certainly the WBBL is one of the toughest competitions. I mean, yeah. I don't think there's any doubt that it's the toughest, you know, domestic competition. I mean, the 100 will obviously have hopes of kind of matching it. 
But, you know, WBBL, it's not a cakewalk. It's not like she's, you know, going and facing a load of club bowlers. She's, she's facing, you know, a pile more full-time professionals from the best country in the world and the toughest exactly. league in the world. So she's doing it out there. So good for her. Yeah. Um, but it does have to be said as well, or, you know, rather to sort of share the credit around, that actually the real story of the Renegades is their other two overseas players, um, Harman Preet and Jamima. Now, they've really come good, haven't they? Um, Harman Preet's now the leading run scorer. She's scored just over 300 runs, 309 runs in the ah, tournament. So she gets to wear the golden she cap. She gets to wear the golden cap or the, the yellow cap. Um, and Jamima's just behind her on 293. She's the second highest run scorer in the tournament as well. And between those two, um, you know, they're they're really turning it on. And, and that's been the difference for the Renegades, really, mm -hmm. that they've got two players that are absolutely, you know, just in the, the, the peak of form. Um, and, you know, Harman Pritt's obviously a great player, but she has suffered generally from sort of inconsistencies in these kind of tournaments, hasn't she? She tends to come to these tournaments. She'll, she'll almost always put in A big innings, but, you know, there, there'll usually be some sort of struggle to, to find her form otherwise. And, you know, we might typically see from Harman Pritt one huge innings, you know, one medium-sized innings, and then a run of low scores. But she's really come together in, uh, on this occasion, and she obviously, you know, really feels comfortable there. And she's kind of dragged Jamima along with her. And taking um, wickets as well, which yeah, is quite yeah, surprising. Yeah, also taking and she, she's not even a, you know she's not a regular bowler for India yeah. at all. She's definitely a part-time bowler. She bowls occasionally for India and in, in domestic cricket, but not not considered a front line. But she's taken twelve wickets, which puts her I think sort of fourth or fifth. I don't know. I can't remember exactly, but it's right up there in the wicket taking. So um, yeah, they they they've been brilliant, and that's part of the Renegades' success. Um, and you know. I think the, the Renegades are looking very likely now mm. to to qualify definitely for the, um, the, the the knockout stages, and if they can make that, you know, continue to you know play like they're doing, then they're going to stay in first place, and then they'll be sitting pretty into the final. Great. Now staying down under, the Halle Burton Johnston Shield um, has started this weekend, um, and there's been some exciting news coming out of that. Um, so this is in New Zealand? In New Zealand. This is their, their sort of uh, premier domestic yeah. list day competition. So Amy Satterthwaite um, has equaled Sarah McGlashan's record of playing 301 list day one day games. Um, so that's a, a New Zealand record um, that they now jointly hold. You would assume that oh, therefore, take about Amy Satterthwaite <laughs> will, be, will be breaking that in a few Next days weekend. time. Um, so good for her. And there's been some happy news about Amelia Kerr, who obviously wasn't out in England in September. Yeah, she, so she's taken quite an extended break um, over the, the, the winter for them, our summer. So, you know, she didn't do the 100. She decided to, to opt out of the tour to England. Yeah. She also opted out of WBBL. Mm -hmm. you know, and all this was very much about protecting her mental health, wasn't it, Raph? Yeah. Um, and there's been a, been a good article that you were reading this morning about that on stuff.nz or stuff.co.nz. Yeah, it? that's it. Yeah, they always have really great stuff about women's cricket. Um, and this article was an interview with her essentially um, reflecting on her mental health health and saying that she's been seeing a, a psychologist weekly um, for the last few months and that that's been really helpful and that she feels that she's in a much better place mentally now um, which is brilliant um, and obviously great for New Zealand kind of going into um, what's going to be a big kind of home summer for them with the World Cup that they're hosting um, and it's kind of um, already paying dividends on the pitch as well isn't it Sid? Well yeah so two games two fifers um, yeah. So, I mean, it just goes to show what, what a quality player she is and how much New Zealand will have missed her. I mean, yeah. you know, New Zealand, um, you know, really could have done with another bowler. I mean, of course, it, she was totally right to, to yeah. prioritise her, her, her personal health. And, you know, actually, in terms of New Zealand as well, because, of course, if she's going to come back, what New Zealand are really interested in is winning the World Cup, right? New Zealand would, would have gone, you know, we don't care if... <laughs> If we can win the World Cup, we can lose the Tour of England 6-0, 7-0, 8-0, they don't care, right? Um, and so in terms of getting players ready for the World Cup, that's what they really want. Yeah. Um, and this, this is looking like a great move because she's come roaring back. She's obviously refreshed and bowling brilliantly and you know 10 wickets across two games two fifers so many players don't wind up with two fifers in their entire career she's taken two in a weekend so what are you going to do yeah so sorry for the new zealand batsmen out there but <laughs> batters sorry <laughs> you're going to get a bollocking from the mcc so if you carry on like that anyway uh closer to home um, and we did kind of trail this in last week's episode um, because we are a little bit behind the times. Um, so it was just over a week ago that the new regional contracts were announced. Um, and um, 
the so um, we know who's got contracts um, and at the same time the ECB also announced that they're going to be funding an, one extra contract per region as we'd suspected um, so each region now has um, six um, although a minimum of six guaranteed although a few of the regions have also um, put in some of their own money and funded extra contracts on top so I think Diamonds now have eight contracted um, professional players um, I'm, uh, for those of you who are listening, I just said that in inverted commas, um, who are, <laughs> who are, who are contracted basically, um, and earning their 18,000 pounds a year. Um, so that was exciting news. Um, I guess that we can feel a, a little bit of kind of, um, smugness in that we were right to some extent because we, um, had said in a previous episode, um, that we felt it was unlikely that any players would be dropped. Um, and that is what's happened. Um, everyone who was contracted last year has has maintained the contract. Um, and um, obviously with the new extra contracts, that's allowed regions to bring new players in without having to make difficult calls, hasn't it, Sid? Yeah, it has. So, I mean, you know, some players have moved around. So Phoebe Graham has moved from um, Yorkshire, sorry, not your from, I can't believe it's not Yorkshire <laughs> to, I can't believe it's not Lancashire. <laughs> From uh, Diamonds, Diamonds to, Thunder, to Thunder, for example. Uh, but as you say, you know, everyone that had a contract last year has still got one this year. Um, I do want to thank the ECB in particular for their timing in announcing this. They announced it as I was on the train, or they, they, they sent a sort of pre-announcement to, um, to us as I was on the train going to the Cricket Society Awards. So I had to write the article uh, hunched on my knees on Vauxhall Station um, <laughs> <laughs> in the cold and the wind. Um, so thanks, guys, for that. <laughs> Um, but yes, uh, no. Don't but somebody it, think of the media. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, overall, you know, it, it, there's, it's great news, isn't yeah. it, for for everybody? And I think there's some some particular contracts that that we want to talk about. Um, so obviously, you, know, you can be smug because you were right about Alice Capsey. Yeah. You? So Alice Capsey's got a contract. Um, you know, we we kind of discussed whether or not she might do because, of course, see, she's still at school for another. Yeah. Um, sort of seven or eight months, um, but I, I figured that given that most of the season which the, to which these contracts apply, because the contracts are running from October to October, so the season to which they apply is next summer. She's going to be, you know, sort of a free agent there, if you like. She'll be, she'll be school, <laughs> school well, she'll is out. School in kind of June. Yeah. yeah so she'll she'll be um, sort of able to become a full time cricketer mm-hmm. at that point. So basically, this has been put in place to allow her to, you know, as soon as the day she leaves school she'll you know basically be a full-time cricketer so i mean that's great news but let's not focus on ice capsi for once let's let's have a look at a couple of other players okay. and think about a couple of other players um so we've got grace scrivens as well um who's been given a contract mm-hmm. so she's i've mentioned her quite a few times in the past year in the same sentence as alice capsi and alice capsi has obviously rocketed up and you know moved up moved things on to another level but grace scrivens i think still remains a, a, a very exciting prospect i still think that she's going to play a lot of lot of games for england you know we saw last season her you know hit a six onto the roof of the pavilion at um, um, Taunton, you know, and that's one of those things that you you, don't, you you can't do unless you're a seriously good cricketer. No, yeah. Nobody does that by accident. And she's not had a huge amount of um, kind of time to be receiving really top quality coaching. So a lot of that is going to come down to natural talent, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and she's a, she's a very exciting player. And that's kind of, for me, that's what the contracts are really all about. They are about giving the exciting players the, the future, um, you know, a, an opportunity to completely focus on cricket and um, to have access to the best coaching and that the access to time at that crucial age yeah. of you know sort of 17 18 19 um, which is what of course happens for all the men when they, that's the typical age when they're coming in and they're they're becoming their full-time cricketers and then that that allows them to mature into kind of entering the, the England team at maybe 23 24 and that's probably more what we're going to see in the women's game in the future we're going to see less teenage debutants because the teenagers are going to come through the regional system in the same way that um, Grace Crivens is doing so um, great news for her and you know the great news that the Sunrisers are putting a bit of investment and kind of into forward talent there in someone yeah. that's obviously I don't think Grace Scrivens is I think she will definitely play for England is providing she continues to work hard at some point but she's definitely not going to play next year whereas I think Alice Capsey really should be playing for England next year um, so I think well, you that, thought she should have been playing well, for, I thought she England been playing for England this year yes so. um, um, Danny Gregory at yeah. Stars is another. Danny Gregory is, one. is a really interesting one. Yeah. I think um, I think that's in some ways a, a little bit more of a punt as well um, because mm. she's. She, I don't think she's quite as nailed on. I think that that Grace Scrivens providing you know she 
carries on doing what she's doing, she will play for England. Um, I'm not so sure about Danny Gregory. She, she's definitely got a future as a, as a very promising regional player. Um, of course, a leg, spin, a leg spinning is the hardest, hardest art in the world, isn't it, Raph? Um, and, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you're not going to necessarily leap straight into it or you, people can leap into it and then, you know, you can go for years and then find you have problems like Sunny Luce was, you know, the best leg spinner in the world for several years. And now, the last three or four years, you know, she's obviously started to really struggle and has, you know, finding it difficult in matches to land the ball on the cut. She still spins the ball a mile. I've watched Sunny Luce bowl, you know, in the nets and in training. Um, I've seen that before games and she still can, you know, bowl the ball and turn it a mile and it's fantastic to see but you put her on a pitch and it's she's struggling. Um, and I think one of the impressive things about Danny Gregory is the amount of control that she has over the ball given how um, how much she spins it. Um, yeah, definitely somebody, a real spinner as yeah. well. She definitely really turns it. Very different to someone like Sarah Glenn who's got that sort of leg spinner's action but it's typically kind of getting maybe a bit of overspin and things. Yeah, and I think that she's got a real shot at being England's next leg spinner. Um, we've seen that um, to some extent um, Sarah Glenn has like, slightly fallen out of favour um, she wasn't selected for any of the New Zealand matches I think I'm remembering that correctly um, and so there is perhaps a vacancy for somebody who does um, turn the ball a bit more um, and what stars are doing is kind of going yeah we think that she could be the next England leg spinner so we're going to bump her up we're going to give her a, a proper full-time contract um, and we're going to see what she can do with it and I think it's it's really exciting um, and that is um, what the contract system should be doing actually um, is is picking those kind of players up so I think to some extent um, as a leg spin bowler she's actually got more of a shot of making the England team than some of these young upcoming batters um, because England are kind of overwhelmed by really really high quality batters but there is a bit of a vacancy for a leg spinner at the moment I think potentially um, so really exciting to see what's going to happen to Danny Gregory I've got a little bit of a theory that I might share about what I think is going on in terms of um, the relationship okay. between the ECB and the regions though okay well remember kids that like evolution this is just a theory <laughs> um, well Here's the thing, I think that last year when the ECB first introduced the contracts, I think that um, this is um, kind of kind of speculative but also based on things that we've picked up along the way and things that we've heard. My understanding is that the ECB said to the regions, um, these contracts are meant to go to people who are not in full-time education. Um, so that means that if you're still at school or if you're at university, um, you don't need a contract because you are a student and therefore we expect those players to still juggle their cricket around because you've got a lot more flexibility than somebody who's working. So you've effectively, if you've got a university student and you've got an extra pro. So that was um, one thing that the ECB said, don't give your contracts to people in full time education. Um, and the other thing that I think um, was, was said was basically we expect these um, players to be full time and not to have other jobs. Um, and, um, you know, if somebody is working full time um, and you hand them a contract, we expect them to not keep their job. Um, so that's my understanding of what was said. Now, what we know is that some of the regions did listen to that. And some of the regions didn't. So some contracts were given to university students, for example, um, and some contracts were given to players. Um, I don't want to single anyone out particularly, but for example, we know that Gwen Davies at Sparks has managed to very successfully combine training and really improving her cricket um, while also um, staying in her teaching in her teaching position. So she's kind of she, I think she cut down on her on some of her teaching duties, um, but she has also um, stayed in that job. Um, and has kept that um, kind of quite prestigious role as, as head of cricket um, or head of head of women's cricket, perhaps um, at Shrewsbury. Um, so she's still doing that while also being a professional um, cricketer or having one of these contracts. Um, so I think that's really interesting that that dynamic. And so what I think has happened this time around is that the other regions have said, OK, well, if everyone else is giving contracts to people in full time education, Alice Capsey um, or, you know, people with other jobs. Um, so Katie Levick, for example, um, why should we not give contracts to that? So we've seen that both so Capsey and Levick have now got professional contracts and very well deserved they are too um, but I do think that there's an interesting dynamic going on whereby perhaps um, how the ECB envisage the contracts and how the regions are actually using them in practice is, is slightly different. Yeah, there's also not... another point to add to that which is um, are you really a 
full-time professional if you are juggling cricket with work and I don't have there's no absolutely no shade on players who feel that they are having to do that because what we are essentially seeing playing out here is that nobody is going to give up a very well um, a very well established career and a job that they've worked hard for in exchange for eighteen thousand pounds a year and absolutely like no job security because the contracts run for a year and you don't know what's going to happen absolutely Sorry, that turned into a rant at the end. <laughs> Were you going to well, say something, Sid? <laughs> oh, I'm sure it wasn't as interesting as whatever you've had to say. <laughs> anyway, I think that's about all we've got time for this week. Um, we will be back next week um, with another show for you. But until then, thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Bye.